Oh, they think they're 110 pounds when they're that size. The big ones think they're small, and the small ones think they're big. Yeah. Right. All right. So picking it back up here. And if you notice, I try to take more religious breaks when we're doing contract law because I know you need, like, you know, you can only tolerate so much of it, and then you need a, you need a minute here. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Offer and acceptance. I'm losing my voice, I think. Um, offer and acceptance. When does it become a contract? That is going to be a really central question on the exam. They're going to give you a lot of different scenarios and they're going to ask you when this agreement becomes a contract. So first of all, we need to define acceptance. Remember, we have an offer E and an offer OR, right? Those are the two parties, offer OR, offer E, and those roles can swap back and forth, correct? Who signs first? Offer or signs first. Acceptance is a legal term that means the offer E has signed the agreement. So the offer E signing is acceptance. You accept an offer by doing what? By signing it. So acceptance is a very legal term. So in other words, you should not say on the phone when you're talking about a client, my client has accepted your offer unless your client has done what? Signed. Has signed it. Because legally, the definition of the word acceptance is signature by the offer E. Does that make sense for everybody? Here's what you need to understand further about that, though. We're still not under contract. Even though we have the signature of the offer or, we have the signature of the offer E, it looks like a contract, it smells like a contract. If you were to look at that document, you would go, contract. It's not yet a binding legal contract because the state of North Carolina says that you can't be under contract until the other side tells you you're under contract. The moment you are put under contract is not an acceptance, so not when you sign, but when that acceptance is communicated back to the other side of the transaction. When the other side is notified that you have signed that contract. It's not the signing that creates the contract. It's the communication that creates the contract. Are you with me on that? That's going to be a hugely important rule. Yes, ma'am. So, the offer or signs it, okay. They send it over to the offer. You said it almost perfect, except I'm going to correct one little thing, right? Because here's what she said. She said, when the offer or signs the offer or contract, you used the word contract, but, just, but offer, right? They send it to the offeree. The offeree signs it. That's acceptance. But it's still not a contract. Is she right? Is everything's right about that? Yes. It's not a contract. And here's where I'm going to go. One minor correction. Because you said it's not a contract until they send it back to the other side. It's not even necessary to send it, being the contract, back to the other side. It's just necessary to communicate it, to let them know. So do you actually have to send them a copy of the contract, or could you just call them and say, we've accepted your offer? You could just call them and say, we've accepted your offer. So it's not the moment that the signature goes on it, it's the moment that the communication happens to the other side. Does that make sense for everybody? So think of a transaction sort of like the division between these rows. 
if Holly is the offer or and Alice is the offer E, then this division has to be crossed twice by that offer. Does that make sense? The offer or makes it, that's one time across. Everybody with me? The offer E accepts it. We're still not under contract because it's got to do what? It's got to go back across that divide between the two parties before it becomes a binding agreement. In other words, in some manner, and it doesn't matter what manner they choose, Alice needs to communicate to Holly that she has accepted that offer. Could she do it with a fax? Yes. Could she do it with a telephone call? Could she send an email with a signed copy of the contract? Yes. It's not necessary to do that, but any of those work. Could she go in person and give her a signed copy of the contract? Could she mail it to her? Absolutely. What matters is that she communicates back across that divide. Is everybody following me on that? Any method of communication works. Did I tell you my granddad's old joke about that? The three best methods of communication? Telephone, telegraph, tell a woman. Those are the three ways that are best communicate anything to make sure everybody knew. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, ladies. I had to. Yeah, I picked on JJ earlier. I had to come back and get, you know, it's equal opportunity offense tonight, you know. That's a cute one, though, isn't it? it you know, it's an oldie but a goodie, you know. It's super cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'm outnumbered. You're right. I'm always outnumbered. I have to be careful with those. I'm outnumbered. That's why I have to make sure you like me first before I use one like that. But any method of communication works. Fax works. You telegraph, in theory, works if you can find one. Um, you know, email works. Smoke signals. Whatever you want to send as a method of communication is fine to look because well, here's the thing the law doesn't specify so any of it works morse and code. morse code yeah you want to flash them down on morse code um here's the thing it also doesn't matter when or if holly actually reads or hears that communication that's not the time that matters the time that matters is when alice sends the communication because remember what creates the contract is going back across the divide right it goes across the divide when it is what when it is sent it's the sending of it so what if Alice calls Holly to say we're under contract I just accepted your offer and she gets her voicemail are we under contract yes does it matter that Holly hasn't even heard the voicemail no no it does not. So let me give you a hypothetical in that same scenario. Let's say Alice does that. She signs and accepts the offer, and she calls Holly to inform her to communicate the acceptance. Is everybody with me? So up to this point, are we under contract? No. So Alice calls Holly. Holly's phone rings. She looks down. She goes, oh, that's that one that's selling that house. And she picks up the phone and she doesn't say hello. She says, listen, um, I've changed my mind. I don't want to buy your house. Uh, what, what can I do for you? Do we have a contract? No, because the offer or can take their offer back at any time prior to communication of acceptance. So if Holly gets it out first, the whole thing's dead. Does that make sense for everybody? Now, I understand that's probably not going to happen in the real world, but I want you to understand it is that moment of communication that actually forms the contract. That's the important moment. Now, we're going to make that significantly more complicated later on when we add agency to this discussion. Because the truth is, very rarely are Alice and Holly going to be in direct communication with each other. Who are they normally going to be talking through? their agents that can significantly complicate things because here's now how you think of it if Holly's hired a listing firm then everybody here is the same as what Holly 
Every broker affiliated with that firm, if you're talking to them, you're talking to who? Holly. If Alice has hired a firm to represent her, then every broker in that firm is the same as talking to Alice. So now we've expanded the communication of acceptance. It doesn't have to go from, from Alice to Holly. It could go from anybody here to anybody here. Could it go, let's say that Alice is working with Ashley. Ashley is her listing broker. Does that make sense to everybody? Ashley's taking the listing. Alice is the seller. Now, Ashley's affiliated with this real estate firm right here. So how many of these brokers represent the seller? All of them. But only one actually knows the seller. Only one is actually dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with the seller. You follow me on that? Okay. Now, Holly has done the same thing. She's hired this listing firm. And she, she's working with Tacey. That's right, Tacey. Awesome. Yeah, let me share. I hardly ever say her name, so I have to like remind, make sure I got it right. Uh, please, by the way, if I ever say your name wrong, correct me. I don't want you to sit there and go, oh, "He said my name wrong." You know, <laughs> just let me know. I really, I, I like names, and I like to try to make sure I know your name, and it's important to me that I know your name. So I've had that happen before. Somebody came up to me at the end of the class and goes, "You know, you said my name wrong the whole class." I'm like, "Why did you say something three weeks ago?" You know, <laughs> like, let me let me know. But so Holly has hired this whole firm to represent her. Tacey's the one who's working with her. She's the one who showed her property. She's the one that helps her write the offer. But how many of these brokers represent Holly? All of them. So now here's how it works out. Tacey sits down with Holly and helps her fill out the offer to purchase and contract. Now she's got the offer. Tacey's going to send it over. She's probably not going to send it directly to the seller because she's not going to have any contact with the seller. Who's Tacey going to send the offer to? to the listing agent, right? She's going to send it to Ashley, the listing broker. Does that make sense? So then Ashley's going to get together with Alice and give her the offer and go over it with her and give her advice and all that good stuff. And Alice decides she wants to accept it, so she signs it. And she emails it back to Ashley. You follow me on that? At what point in time did this become a binding contract? wrong. It hasn't become a binding contract. Who did she send it to? She sent it to herself. Everybody here is the same person. Does that make sense? And that's what you have to be so careful of on the exam is to make sure that when you're communicating, you're actually communicating across this barrier between the buyer and the seller. So Alice emailing that to Ashley doesn't accomplish anything. We're still not under contract. So now Ashley's got it. She leaves it in the office. She forgets. The next morning, she picks up the phone and she calls Ivy, who she knows is in the office that day. And she says, Ivy, look, I left this contract on my desk. Can you go get it for me? And Ivy goes and picks it up. Are we under contract yet? No. no. We communicated with somebody else, but where are they? Yeah. Same team, right? We still haven't crossed that divide. Ivy says, all right, I'll send it to you. I'll email it to you. But I also went ahead and emailed it to my friend JJ who works over at that office. What do we have now? A contract. A contract. And here's the crazy thing. Do the broker or the buyer have any freaking idea we're under contract? No, but the way the law works is when I'm talking to JJ, that's the same thing as talking to Tacey, is the same thing as talking to Holly, the buyer, because they're on this side of the fence. Does that make sense? The law assumes that everybody here knows the same thing. And that everybody here knows. So if you tell one here, you've told everybody. If you tell one here, you've told everybody. Does that make sense? So it's always about, so when you get these communication of acceptance questions, what I would say to you is the best way to handle them is actually kind of just draw it out as teams. Like set yourself up a little like chart and put buyer and seller. 
and then as they start giving you the names and what their roles are, just label them. Right? So let's, like, let's go back through that whole story again. Let's say Holly's a buyer who's hired Tacy's firm, HPW Real Estate, to represent her. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start right there. Where, where's Holly going? Buyer, buyer right? Where's Tacy going? Buyer side, right? She's hired T-A-I-T-E-I-C-Y. She's hired Tacy's firm, HPW, to represent her. So HPW is also on the buyer side, right? Is everybody with me on that? Holly is interested in purchasing a home in Garner, which is owned by Alice, who is represented by Ashley of Keller Williams. So what am I going to do on the seller side? Alice. Alice. Ashley. Keller Williams. Keller Williams. And see, I don't even need to know which one is the seller and which one is the agent, because the thing of it is, they're all what? They're all the same for our purposes here. Are you with me? So then I'm just going to start drawing arrows. Because here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an arrow going both directions. That's when we have a contract. So here's what I'm going to say. Holly sits down with Tacy, and they prepare an offer to purchase and contract. Well, there's one arrow. Doesn't mean anything, does it? Tacy sends the offer over to listing broker Ashley. So what am I going to do? Draw an arrow across the One arrow. We're halfway home. Does that make sense? The listing broker Ashley presents the offer to seller Alice. Seller Alice signs it, accepts it, and emails it back to Ashley. Does that make sense so far with the arrows? Have we got a contract yet? No. Because no, we still haven't crossed the divide. Ashley goes home. She forgets it on her desk. She, the following morning, she contacts broker Ivy, who's in the office that day, and asks her to go pick up the contract from her desk. So now here we go again. With that. Ivy goes on what side? Seller. The seller side. So now it's down here at Ivy. Ivy emails it to Ashley, but she also sends a copy to her friend JJ, who works at HPW. So what am I going to do with JJ? JJ with JJ on the buyer side, and I'm going to draw an arrow from Ivy to JJ. What do we have? Contract. Contract. Same physical location. Same. Physical, not, same not that's, that's exactly right. That office. That particular office. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. And now here's going to be the complicating factor, and then I'll let it ruminate in your brain. Leave it alone for a little while. What would a counter offer do to all those arrows? Start over. Just. Erase all the arrows and start over with the names in place and start drawing the arrows again from the counter offer forward. Does that make sense? Because everything that happened before the counter offer gets erased by the counter offer. And that's why I say just erase all the arrows. As soon as you see they made a change, they adjusted this, blah, 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 like, oh, counter offer, boom, erase all the arrows and start over and start following those arrows back and forth. And anytime you get to one arrow going this way and one arrow coming back that way with no changes being made, you got a what? Contract. You got a contract. You got a contract. That is the idea of offer and acceptance. So when, at what moment do we have a contract? When we have communication of acceptance. Acceptance is the signing by who? The offer E. The offer E signs, that's acceptance, but we're still not under contract until we've communicated that acceptance. And it's not when it's received, it's when it is what? Sent. sent. It is when it is sent. That's when we have communicated that acceptance, when we send the communication. Are there, I said any method's okay. Are there better methods than others? Yes. What would be the best method most likely? Email. Email. Something that leaves some kind of a verifiable trail. Date and time stamp would be very important. Absolutely. And so email is a wonderful thing. Here's why I love email. Because not only am I going to communicate acceptance, what am I probably going to attach to the email? The actual contract itself. If I'm sending you a, an email saying, you know, congratulations, my clients have accepted your offer. Well, if my clients have accepted your offer means my clients have done what? Signed. Have signed it. I may as well go ahead and send you a copy of it. That's the best possible way to communicate acceptance. But any method of communication works. Okay? We good? Yes. Good. Good. 
We, we talked about the statute of frauds and we talked about the parole evidence rule, but this is just kind of a last final reminder. The statute of frauds says that real estate sales contracts must be in writing in order to be what? Enforceable. So therefore, real estate sales contracts that are not in writing are what? Unenforceable. Remember, that's a very specific terminology. Unenforceable. Okay? The parole evidence rule, that's what we talked about earlier with making changes to a written agreement. Once an agreement is in writing, we can only make changes how? In writing. That's called the parole evidence rule. It just means you can't make oral adjustments or changes to a previously written agreement. So now I'm gonna, uh, now that I bring that up, I'm going to point out to you uh, something that the, the day class struggled with on the midterm. And I'm not really giving away a question because it's something we've talked about anyway, but I want to point it out again. This parole evidence rule says you can't change a written agreement with oral language. Does that make sense? Yes. Talk to me about a listing agreement. Listing agreements must always be what? Writing. In writing. So if you're going to change a listing agreement, what's the only way to change it? In writing. In writing. So if you have a written listing agreement with a seller who does not authorize dual agency, what's the only way you can get future permission to do dual agency from that seller? They have to give it in writing before you can even show the property because they've previously told you in writing what? No. no, that you can't do it. So therefore, you can't do it until you get their permission in what? Writing. Writing. That is different than the buyer side of the transaction. On the buyer side of the transaction, you might have what kind of an agreement? Oral. An oral agreement. Can you get oral permission from a buyer for dual agency if you're working with them on an oral agreement? Yes. yes. But if you have put that buyer agency agreement into writing, what kind of permission do you have to have from the buyer as well? In writing. Is everybody okay with that? So be careful of that kind of thing on a test. That's just the parole evidence rule. Essentially what we're saying is you already put it in writing, that means you can only change it with writing. So just talk me through the logical conclusion. Let's say you had this listing. It's your firm's listing. It's not your personal listing. But you pull up in front of it. Your buyer wants to see it. You recognize it's your firm's listing, and you look down at the listing sheet, and there's a note on the agent only that says, no dual agency. The seller did not authorize dual agency. Uh-oh. What can you not do? You can't show it. Now, your buyer, you've got an oral buyer agency agreement with them. You just work with them. It's the first day you've been out with them. You don't have a written agreement. Would it be okay to get their oral permission to show that property? Yes. The buyers, right? Yes. It would. But what about the seller? Yes. No. You're going to have to get in touch with either the seller themselves or the listing broker and have them get in touch with the seller, have a conversation with the seller, find out if dual agency is okay, and if they say it's okay, then do what? Get it, get it in writing before you can even walk in the door. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, so be, be careful about that. Be careful about that. All right? Some other con concepts that you may come into contact with with uh, contract law. Time is of the essence. This is an expression we use a lot, but people don't really realize it's actually a contract verbiage. Time is of the essence. When you see that in a contract, you would see it after a date. It only shows up after a date, a deadline of some sort. When a contract has a deadline in it, it will either say time is of the essence or it won't say time is of the essence. Here's what you need to understand about contracts and deadlines. It's not a strict deadline unless it says time is of the essence. So let me explain. Let's say you look at a sales contract and it says closing date is August 15th, period. That's all it says. Are we in breach of the contract if we have not closed by August 17th? No. Nope. Because it did not say what? 
time is of the essence. If it doesn't say time is of the essence, then that August 15th is intended to just be a target. And you're not necessarily in breach if you miss a target. Does that make sense? But when we talk about tomorrow night, the contract, the standard offer to purchase and contract from the North Carolina Association of Realtors, there's going to be something in there called a due diligence date. And when you look at that due diligence date, it says the due diligence period shall begin on the effective date, that's just the date we go under contract, and shall continue through 5 p.m. on blank, comma, time being of the essence. What do you think that means about that date in the contract? That is a firm deadline. And here's another hint. If it bothered to say 5 p.m., I imagine they're pretty damn serious about that deadline, right? It didn't leave it open for interpretation. You know? So that phrase showing up after a date means it's a very serious deadline. That means if you miss it by even a minute, you're what? You're in breach. You're in breach. So whenever you see that phrase in a contract, you better pay special attention to that date. It's not to say you can ignore other dates, but other dates have some flex in them. Time being of the essence date or time is of the essence dates have no flex. Okay. The idea of a novation. A novation. The, the prefix nova means new. A novation is a new contract. But it's a new contract between old people, old parties. I don't mean they're old as in they are chronologically challenged. I mean, they're the same parties. Let me give you an example. Let's say we have a contract where Michelle is the buyer and Trudy is the seller. And they've agreed that Michelle is going to pay Trudy $150,000 for this property. And we're going to close on August 15th. Is everybody okay with that? As is, $150,000 closing on August 15th. Now, Michelle comes in and she does a home inspection and she finds a ton. She knew there was going to be some problems, but she finds a ton of things wrong with this house. She found foundation issues. The HVAC system is blown up. There's water in the crawl space. There's a leak in the roof. I mean, there's all kinds of problems going on. Now, she was anticipating some problems, but she was not anticipating this many problems. But she still wants to buy the property. She just doesn't want to buy it at the price she's currently under contract. Does that make sense? Or she doesn't want to buy it at that price with these problems. So what she asks Trudy to do is fix the problem. She says, here, I'd like you to fix these things. And Trudy says, I don't have the money to fix all that stuff. That's why I told you I was selling it as is in the first place. And, so, and Michelle says, well, can you fix some things? And Trudy said, well, I can fix these four things. I can afford these four things I think I can fix. And Michelle says, well, if you'll fix those four things and you'll lower the purchase price to $140,000 and you'll give me a home warranty, then, then we can move forward. And then Trudy comes back and says, okay, okay, we can do all that. I, I, we'll lower the purchase price to one forty, dollars and I'll fix these four things and I'll buy you a home warranty. But... It, I can't get this stuff fixed by August 15th, so we need to also change the closing date to September 15th. Does it, you, you see what's going on here? That literally everything we agreed to originally has gotten what? Changed. Changed, blown up. Now, here's the thing. We could go back to that contract, and we could take each one of those things and make an individual change. We could put one line through it, put the new number in, and have all the parties initial and date that change. But we're going to be changing the purchase price. We're going to be changing the closing date. We're going to be changing repairs. We're going to be changing the warranty. After a while, is that contract going to start to look like a jumbled up mess because of all the changes? So what would be better to do in that case is what's called a novation. We would simply say, let's tear up the old agreement and write a what? And write a new one. Here's what stays the same, the two parties. You got the same seller, you got the same what? Buyer. The property stays the same, the parties stay the same, just their agreement changes. That's a novation. The idea is that the new contract takes the place of the old contract.
Yes, sir. I'm sorry, just, just a little side question off that. Uh, drafting, if I understand correctly, can be done by the buyer or the seller on the contract, not the agent. And That's correct. They have to put the writing itself. Do they have to handwrite all the writing on it themselves? Like, do they do the crossing out and put no writing in the chain? Let's just say it's a small amount of change. You don't want to draw up a new contract. It's just, just a couple of things. Well, the kinds of changes you're talking about would not be considered drafting language. They're the kinds I'm talking about. I don't know what you're talking about in your head because you may be having a different mental conversation. But the kinds of changes I'm talking about, like purchase price, those would be things that I would have written in the contract as a broker anyway. So I'm only changing things that I was allowed to do. Because I'm allowed to fill in the blanks, right, with dates and numbers. So I can make those changes. What I couldn't change is like pre-printed language that's in the contract. So that that's a bit, is that does that help? Okay. Yes. Yeah, but a big amendment. It's like just scrap it, tear it up, start over fresh. That's a novation. It's a new agreement. As a matter of fact, on the test, they will almost always use that phrase, new agreement, because that's what novation means. Does that make sense? The parties stay the same. It's important to hang on to that because we're getting ready to do the opposite. What do you think we're getting ready to do? If this one is the, the agreement changes but the parties stay the same, what do you think the next one's going to be? The parties change but the agreement stays the same. That is an assignment. An assignment of contract happens when you have an agreement between two parties and one of the two parties wants out. But rather than just be in breach and suffer the penalty for being in breach, they find somebody to take their place. You essentially go to the other party that you've entered a contract with and you say, listen, I don't want to buy this property, but Alice does. And Alice is willing to take over my spot She's willing to take over all the responsibilities I have in this contract. Can I please take my name off and put her name on? That's an assignment. Does that make sense? That's an assignment of contract. That Now, that could happen in a sales contract. That could happen in a lease. Could you ever imagine a time when somebody might need to get out of a long-term lease? Like what if you open up? What, no, I did not say subleasing. It's a very different thing. I said at what? Assignment. Assignment. What if a restaurant goes out of business and they got five years left on their lease? Do they need to get out of it? Yes. What's the best way for them to get out of it? Find somebody, Find somebody to take their place. Find somebody to take over that lease. Now, whose permission are they going to need? The landlords. They're going to need to go to the other party and say, listen, I need out. My restaurant has failed, but I have found you a new tenant. Can you please allow them to take my place? Does that make sense? Yes. You need the per Now, could you get the permission in advance? In other words, when you originally draft the contract, could you draft it in such a way that says this contract is assignable? Absolutely. How many of you see these signs alongside the road that say, we buy houses? Let me introduce you to the assignment sales contract. Those people do not buy houses. That's a lie. They don't. They sign contracts to buy houses. So let's say Marlo has a house to sell, and she calls that number. And why do people call that number? Be honest with me. Why do people call that number, we buy houses? They're desperate. They're desperate. Why don't they call a real estate broker? They don't want to pay the commission, but I'll give you the, the more likely reason. They're too embarrassed for somebody to come in their house. That's the most common reason right there. They're too embarrassed about the way their house looks, the way they'll be judged, to have buyers come look at their house. So they, they know, they know that by calling that number, they're probably not getting as much as they possibly can. But it's worth it to them not to have to suffer through the embarrassment 
uh, a real estate broker and tell them you've got to clean this up, you've got to paint this, you've got to do this shit. Because that's what we do, man. You ever met with one of us? We walk in there, we're like, damn drill sergeant. No, 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 this is a pigsty. Clean this up, scrub this carpet, stretch this out, move it. That's what I do. You bring me in there, I'm going to hurt your feelings. I'm going to ask you in advance if that's what you want. Because here's what I'm going to say to you. I'm going to say, listen. You did not hire me to hear what you need, what you want to hear. You hired me to hear to say what you need to hear. My job is to represent your best interests, and that means telling you the hard truth about. It. Does that make sense? Now, people have a variety of reasons why they might call that number, but that's the biggest one. So, say Marlo calls that number, and this person shows up. This buyer, we buy houses. And he says, yes, ma'am, I will buy your house. I'll pay you cash for it. But now, I will make sure you got plenty of time to get your stuff together and get out of here. So we're not even going to rush you. Let's just say we'll close in 90 days. How's that sound to you, ma'am? Okay, that sounds all right to me. So then he whips out a contract. Now, who drafted that contract? Either he did himself or an attorney that he hired did. Who do you think this contract favors dramatically? Him. This buyer. And so he puts it in front of the seller and they sign it. So Marlo agrees to sell this house for $175,000. So I'm going to write that number down. She agrees to sell this house for $175,000 cash to JT. Let me press it. 175? 175. To JT. And we're closing, what was it, September, October, November 10th. That's the contract they signed. Somewhere later on in the fine print of that contract, there's a little paragraph in there that says assignment of contract. And it's going to have some kind of language that says JT has the right to assign this contract at his option to any buyer of his choosing. You with me so far? And then there's going to be a paragraph below it that says permission to market the property. And it's going to say JT shall have the right to begin marketing the property as of the effective date of this contract. So when does JT have the right to put that house up for sale? Yeah. Right now. As soon as this contract goes as soon as this contract goes into effect. Now we're not closing for 90 days. So now Marlo comes home the next day. Now do people read what they sign? No. Mm -mm, she didn't read this thing. All she saw was $175,000 cash. That's all she saw. That's the way it happens. You think they'd read something for that kind of thing. You would think. They don't. Wow. And so Marlo comes home the next day and there's a for sale sign sitting in the front yard of her house. And so she calls JT and she says, listen, I don't understand. There's this sign out in my front yard that says for sale. And he said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, what do you mean it's for sale? I thought I was selling it to you. He said, well, you are, ma'am, but I'm going to resell the house. She said, well, well, why don't you wait till you own it to resell it? And he said, well, I don't have to because your contract gives me the right to sell it right now. And so JT shows up a month later, and he says, Marlo, good news. I need to introduce you to the person who's going to buy your house. And she said, what do you mean? I thought you were buying my house. He says, oh, no, ma'am. I found somebody who loves your house so much. They're going to buy it straight from you. They're not even going to wait for me to buy it. They're going to buy it straight from you. So all we're going to do is take, that, take my name off of this contract and do what? And put their name on. So the only thing that changes, nothing changes about the agreement except JT. Now we got... Tom. Buyer Tom is who's buying Marlowe's house. And how much is Buyer Tom buying Marlowe's house for? 175 to her. How much is he actually paying for it? Well, there's a magic question. I guarantee you it ain't 175 It's probably 225 235 
but only 175 is going to Marlowe. Where's the difference going if it's 225? Where's that other $50,000 going? It's going to JT for taking his name off that contract. That is an assignment contract. So he going to skip the real estate agent when it's paid over here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, they don't have to be licensed because he's a party to the contract. He's the buyer. He's the buyer. He just gypped her, but he's the buyer. Well, I mean, it's all. Moves forward like a normal transaction. Is that, at that point in time, except JT's checked out, moved on to the next one, counting his fifty thousand dollars. And here's the thing: what if Tom actually goes belly up and doesn't even close? JT liable for anything? No, because JT's name's off the contract, and leave Marlo fight with Tom. When, in all actuality, it may have only been. $10,000. Whatever the number is. To fix up for Marla to fix mm -hmm. up her place. Yes, ma'am. Does JT have to go to closing and get his money, or could he get his money when he assigns your place? That really depends on how the contract is structured between JT and Tom. Sometimes it's in advance, sometimes they have to wait till closing. A lot of that depends on if the buyer's financing or not. Because if Tom's financing, if he's paying $225 finance, you're not going to have the money until you get the loan. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. That was very close to what I wanted to ask. How was JT going to get his money from Tom? Because he's gone on to the next one and still won't get paid. Right. You know? And then even with that, how is she going to be fighting Tom? He going to belly up. I mean, basically, she doesn't sell the house at all. That's right. But how did JT even get money to get the house? Well, it depends on how that contract is structured. If Tom's paying cash, he might pay JT the $50,000 right now. So Tom breaks. It could be. <laughs> That's right. Two separate contracts. And Tom probably didn't read it. And that's right. It's not just Marlo who doesn't know what's really going on here. Tom doesn't either. And so here, because because all these buyers that go to these websites and say, you know, oh, we've got secret listings that aren't available, they don't realize that they're not actually buying it from the owner of the property until they get into it, right? They think they're dealing with the owner. They're not dealing with the owner. They're dealing with somebody who would have signed up on the side of the road. That's an assignment contract. Yes, ma'am. And even with that, if you financing, it's still got to go through the process of, you know, to get an appraisal and all this kind sure. of stuff. Sure. It becomes a normal transaction. All this kind of stuff. It becomes a normal transaction, but JT doesn't care about that because most likely he's gotten his money and gone. How do the JTs keep getting away with that? Because that happens a lot. I mean, like you see it everywhere. It does because they all went to a Holiday Inn Express on a Saturday morning and paid somebody to tell them how to do it. Uh -huh. Of course you have. Yes, ma'am. JT is not a broker. He doesn't have to be. What's the rule of brokerage? Doing it for who? For someone else. He's not doing it for somebody else. He's a party to the contract. I wish he had to be a broker, but that's not what the brokerage rule says. Because he's a party to the contract, he's allowed to do that. It's basically practicing real estate brokerage without a license when you start to look at it that way, isn't it? It is very much that way. And it avoids all the requirements to give disclosures and all that kind of thing. Because, see, JT not being licensed, he doesn't have to tell Marlo that he intends to sell her property for a profit. We as real estate brokers... Dude, that's a material fact, remember? Okay. Some questions. How is she able to sell the house without the person viewing the property? You'd be shocked if the number of people will buy something sight unseen in this market. You'd be shocked. Oh, 
online? I'd say that's probably 10% of the market right now in, wow. in Raleigh. Wow. Bought sight unseen. Because they go so fast, you don't have time to look at them. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, they're they looking at the fact they're already getting the price at the house at this kind of price. I, I, obviously, if she's willing to go through this at 175 it would more be more likely than this kind of They feel like it is, right. Feel like it. Right. It's Absolutely. Like they do a little bit of work to it. Do you have one? Um, JT, he probably would only get in trouble if, um, if he couldn't find somebody to assign that's when the whole and thing blows could, up because here's yeah. going to be the problem I bet you JT doesn't have $175,000 because yeah. when you see that thing that they tell you to come to the Holiday Inn Express what's the first thing they tell you you ain't got to have no money and see that's the whole fraud of the thing I got no problem with it as long as JT's actually got the funds go. to complete that transaction but if JT's going in and presenting this offer knowing there's no way he can fund that transaction. I have a real problem with it. Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But uh, to piggyback back off of what Marlo has said, um, are we in a market regardless, even if you don't see a sign that says we buy houses, other houses, whatever, um, that people still will go online and buy? Sure, people buy sight and seen all the time, even even with stuff that's in regular inventory on the MOS. I mean, I've sold houses in the last two years sight and seen because you got out of state buyers. They know they can't get here by the time. I mean, you know, if you got a buyer who's in Pennsylvania and they know they're relocating to North Raleigh and they want to be up here in North Raleigh and they're looking at the 350 to 450 price point, they want 2,500 square feet, a uh, fenced in backyard off of Durant Road and they, you know, the house had to be built in the last 10 years. Man, I'm telling you, when that hits the market, you better be ready to roll because you don't have two days to think. And so you get that buyer and they miss out on five or 10 in a row, all of a sudden one hits the market, they're like, make an offer on it. Right. They, they do. You go, I mean, listen, it is nothing now to go into a house that just came on the market that day and you walk in there and this is what you see with real estate brokers. You know what they're doing? They're FaceTiming an out-of-town client to see if they want to make an offer on it because they can't get there that day and they know it's going to go under contract that day or the next day. They know they don't have time to get here to actually physically look at it. So they're in there with FaceTime. What do you want to see? They're showing them. Does that make sense? It happens. It does happen. Are we good on the difference between an assignment and an innovation? In a novation, the agreement changes, but the parties stay the same. In an assignment, the agreement stays the same, but well, who changes? The parties. the parties. At least one of them, usually just one. Okay? Could we do it? And as we said, we could do an assignment with a lease as well, right? Yes. Usually, what party would it be that changes on a lease? The tenant. The tenant. It would usually be the tenant that changes on a lease. That's right. That's right. So, how do we end a contract? Discharge of a contract. Contracts are ended or discharged in a number of ways. Most of them deal with some type of performance. The best is full performance. That means all of the promises have been fulfilled. When you say we have full performance of a contract, what we're simply saying is that everything that we promised to do has happened. Does that make sense for everybody? I put this up one time and somebody said this is like an erectile dysfunction ad right here. Full performance, partial performance. Now, don't get down here to impossibility of performance. It gets rough. It gets rough. I, I don't know what's worse. Impossibility of performance or mutual agreement to cancel? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one is worse right there. See, I'm the only person in the world can make that funny, isn't it? You know, like, God. <laughs> it takes a lot of years to learn how to make a joke out of this mess, you know. <laughs> but contracts can always be discharged by some type of performance. 
Obviously, the best way is everybody did what they promised to do. <laughs> Impossibility of performance definitely does in the contract, too. So, like, for example, if you have a buyer who has to get a loan and they can't get the loan, that's an impossibility of performance, right? And that would end the contract. Now, it doesn't mean it wouldn't be a breach. It would definitely be a breach. And then there would be penalties associated with that breach. What we mean by that it ends the contract is you can't just keep running around chasing this person for the rest of their life going, you promised to buy my house. Well, yeah, I did, but I can't because I can't get a loan. You know, that's, that's what we mean by impossibility of performance. And of course, you can always end any agreement with a mutual agreement if the two parties agree to release each other. Now, that's the two most likely from your perspective as a real estate broker are full performance or mutual agreement. Those are the two most likely by far. Mutual agreement, obviously, when the two parties just say, we're done, just let it go. Okay? Nobody? Operation of law would be some type of a lawsuit. So like, for example, or it could be something like eminent domain. That's an operation of law. Like if the state comes in and takes the property, that would end the contract as well. Any type of court action would be an operation of law. And then the last thing in this chapter that we deal with is damages or remedies. Remedies are fixes for a breach. When a contract is breached, there are penalties associated with that. There, does that make sense to everybody, that there would be a penalty associated with breaching a contract? Really good contracts specify what the damages will be. Sometimes they don't. Most damages come from a court of law. So we want to talk about the types of damages that come from a court of law. If you have to go see this young lady, then you are suing someone for either compensatory damages or consequential damages. And we need to talk about the difference between those two. The word compensatory, what's the root word there? Compensation. Compensate. You compensate someone for their actual losses. Compensatory damages are damages that someone is awarded when they can show receipts and say, you cost me this much money. So uh, we, uh, let's take it out of real estate for a second. Let's use a car accident. Let's say you're rear-ended going down 440. What kinds of things might you sue the person who rear-ended you for that you could show receipts for? Medical expenses. Fixing the car. What else? Time loss from work. You could show what your daily rate at work is and how many days of work. You could turn in a receipt for that. The cost of renting a car while yours was being fixed. Could you turn in a receipt for that? So medical expenses, fix my car, Time off from work, child care, wow. What are you taking care of yourself? Because I know there ain't no way you got one to take care of. <laughs> you miss, so that's an interesting one. Missing a wedding. It's very hard to put a receipt on that. Would you agree? If it's yours, no, right? If it's yours, no. But I'd say attending someone else's. I could maybe put a receipt on the airfare or a receipt on the hotel deposit that I lost. Does that make sense? And that would all be compensatory because I'd have a receipt for it. There's a whole other category of damages, though, that, that we haven't talked about. The ones you don't have a receipt for. We usually refer to it by a cheerful euphemism. Pain and suffering. Those are called consequential damages. These are the things that don't have receipts. These are the things where you're asking a judge, oh my God, I've hurt so much, I can't even get out of the car anymore. In fact, I can't even get in the car anymore because I'm terrified of driving. I had to retire from work. I can't leave the house. My fiance left me because we don't go out to eat anymore. <laughs> Can I put a receipt on any of that mess? 
No, but do people make those arguments in court all the time? Yes, and they can be awarded damages based on those arguments. Those damages are called consequential damages. So basically the dividing line is if you can turn a receipt in for it, you're suing for what? Compensatory damages. For anything you don't have a receipt for, but you're still asking for money in exchange for it, that is consequential damages. Does that make sense to everybody? So make sure you can identify the difference between those two on a test. This last one down here on the bottom, specific performance, is not a lawsuit for damages as much as it is a lawsuit to force somebody to do what they promised to do. They have breached, and rather than money, you want action. You don't want the money. You want action. You want them to do what they promised to do. That's what a lawsuit for specific performance is. This is, happens in real estate in only one sense. A buyer who is suing a seller. And what are they suing the seller for? What are they asking the court to force the seller to do? Sell me the property. You promised to sell me the property. I want the property. I don't want your money. I don't want any damages. I want what? The property. I want you to perform what you promised you would. That's a lawsuit for specific performance. Does that make sense for everybody? It only works from the standpoint of a buyer suing a seller. A seller cannot sue a buyer for specific performance. Because if a seller was suing a buyer for specific performance, what would they be asking the court to do? Force the buyer to do what? Buy a property. Remember way back in chapter 5, we talked about transfer of title. We said you could only take ownership of property voluntarily. Nobody can force you to take ownership of property. So a buyer can't be forced to buy property. What would a seller be suing for? Some type of damages, either compensatory or what? So give me an example of compensatory damages that a seller might sue for if a buyer breached a sales contract in a real estate transaction. Moving expenses. Moving expenses. I paid my movers $5,000 non-refundable. That's a compensatory damage because I had to spend it you got to reimburse me. Does everybody agree with that? What about title work? So the attorney charged me $500 for the title work and I've already paid for it so you got to reimburse me for that. They're losing money on something that they were going to buy. We put a non-refundable $10,000 deposit down on our next house, and your breach has caused us to lose that $10,000. Can we search your receipt for that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's compensatory. What about furniture for the new house? Furniture for the new house is not really a damage, though. That was a choice you made. Choice. Your breach didn't cause that. What kinds of consequential damages might be associated with something like that? The stress. Oh my, the stress is killing me, Your Honor. I can't, I can't even think straight anymore. I, got, I lost my job. I, I got so stressed out I hadn't slept in three weeks. I beat my children every day. Well, you think if you think you, you had your house sold and then all of a sudden you don't, I mean, you stress. Stress, right? That could be super consequential damage. Does, does that make sense for everybody? So, but you can't, as a seller, sue the buyer for specific performance. That only works one direction. That is buyer suing seller. Is everybody good on that? Now, let's talk about avoiding this lady altogether. Because the best place, the best way to handle a court case is to never go to court. Stay out of a courtroom if you possibly can. And that's where we talk about liquidated damages. Liquidated damages are your best friend in a real estate transaction. Because liquidated damages do not involve a judge and do not involve a court of law. It is possible for the two parties in a contract to agree in advance that if they mess up, they will pay each other a certain amount of money. They've agreed in advance that it will cost them this much if they breach. Does that make sense for everybody? Here's the beauty of that. 
you don't have to sue to get it. You know if the other party breaches, you're owed this amount of money because what? They agreed they would pay it. Does that make sense to everybody? Here's the beauty from the breaching party side. Yeah, I just lost my money, but I'm not going to get what? Sued. Because the idea of liquidated damages is that both parties agree that if there's a breach, this is it. It's over. This amount of money is going to clear the thing out. This, this liquidates all the damages. Does that make sense to everybody? So, the breaching party knows they can't get sued. The party who was breached knows they're going to get that certain amount of money. That's liquidated damages. The key is they've agreed in advance before they ever went under contract. It was part of the original negotiation. It's like a contingency plan for the worst case scenario, right? It's like, we love you and we trust you and all, but if you mess up, here's how much it's going to cost. Like a settlement. Like a settlement in some ways, but decided in advance. That's liquidated damages. Yes, sir, JJ. Uh, maybe I'm jumping in. I have, um, in my mind, was there a situation where the, the buyer can still sue the seller in addition to this, this remedy taking place? There's no such thing as suing in addition to liquidated damages. If there are liquidated damages, there is no what? There's no lawsuit because the whole point of liquidated damages is to avoid a what? A lawsuit. Now, there are contracts, as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about one tomorrow night, where the liquidated damages only work in one direction. Oh, maybe that, where liquidated damages says if one party breaches, here's what it's going to cost them, but if the other party breaches, all bets are off. You can sue as much as you want to. The contract we talk about tomorrow night, the, the contract, the offer to purchasing contract, it uses liquidated damages for the most common type of breach. What do you think the most common type of breach is? Buyer breaching or seller breaching? You think the seller breaching is the most common? Buyer, by far. Buyer breaching. Buyer changes their mind. Buyer has an inspection. They don't like what they find. Whatever. Back out. Can't get a loan. Can't get financing. Doesn't appraise. There's a thousand reasons why buyer breach contracts all the time. And because it's so common, that contract says the best way to handle a buyer breach is with liquidated damages. Because otherwise, we'd end up with these things where all the time? In court. In court. So, that contract sets up a certain amount of money that the buyer and the seller agree on in advance that if the buyer breaches, that money will be forfeited to the seller as liquidated damages. We call it the earnest money deposit. The earnest money deposit in that contract says it will serve as liquidated damages in the event of a buyer breach. So what do we do? We collect the money from the buyer as soon as we go under contract. We put it in a trust account and we hold it until one of two things happens. Either we close or the buyer what? Breaches. And if the buyer breaches, what do we do with the money? Give it to the seller. Give it to the seller as liquidated damages. What that means though, the seller gets it without having to go to court, but they also don't have the right to what? Sue for more. They don't have the right to sue for more. And I hear sellers all the time go, well that ain't enough. Well dummy, whose fault is that? You agreed to it. So does that put a whole new perspective on the importance of the amount of an earnest money deposit for you as a seller? If you're a seller, the way you should look at the earnest money deposit on that contract is, is this going to be enough money if this buyer backs out on the day of closing? If we wake up on the day of closing and they just decide not to buy my house, is this enough money to compensate me for that? Because this is all I'm going to get. They may have to pay their listing agent. Absolutely. Are you all with me on that? Yes, ma'am. Now they've got a really high of like 10,000. Sure. Because it used to be lower. It used to be lower when it was more of a buyer's market. Now, to JJ's question, that contract that we're going to go over tomorrow night doesn't say anything about liquidated damages for a seller breach. What it says is that if the seller breaches, 
the minimum is that the seller will give the buyer all their money back and pay for everything that the buyer spent trying to buy the property. But then it goes on to say, not limited to that remedy though. What does that mean in contractual language? It means they can sue and they would be suing for what kind of damages? Either compensatory damages, consequential damages, or potentially specific performance. The buyer could sue for any of those. Could they sue for more than one? Could they sue for all of them? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, usually if you're suing for specific performance, you are also suing for compensatory damages because one of the things you're going to want to be compensated for is the cost of your attorney. Right? If you've got to sue the seller to make them sell you the damn thing, I want the money I had to pay the attorney. Not only that, have I been stressed by having to sue you to sell, get you to sell me the house? Could I sue you for consequential damages as well? That's going to get ugly for a seller. It's going to get really ugly for a seller. Yes, JJ. Yeah, yeah. Is it fair to say that liquidated damages basically just benefit the seller? Liquidated damages benefits whomever the contract specifies. You're trying to make everything fit into a little perfect little JJ world. It doesn't work that way. And I'm not picking on you by saying that. What I'm saying is, you have to know what we're talking about when I say the contract is I'm talking about what that one says. So you just asked me a very broad question that I can't answer. Who does liquidated damages benefit? It benefits whoever the contract you're reading says it benefits. Now, in that contract, who does it benefit? The seller. The liquidated damages are for the benefit of the seller. Could you have a contract where it was liquidated damages both ways? It, the only way that would work is if the seller also put money in an account somewhere in the case of a breach. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am, Marla. But you said ultimately the whole purpose of the liquidated damages is to just avoid going to court. Avoid going to court. Because it's so common that, group, that buyers breach these agreements. It's very common. And we don't want all those things to end up in court. So we just make it clear. Because here's the way you explain it to a buyer. When a buyer comes to you and says, look, I need to get out of this thing, can you very clearly tell them, well, here's what it costs you to get out? What do you say to them? Your what? Your earnest money. It costs you your earnest money. Get out if you want. You'll be out. But you're forfeiting your earnest money. You with me on that? As liquidated damages. Yes, ma'am. So these things just been put in place and when you say you're ready to sell it, you say you're ready to fight it, you're serious. You need to be very serious because breaches are very serious. Absolutely. Are we good on damages? Okay. Last slide in the whole chapter. We perfect time in finishing it up. We've already talked about it, so we don't need to spend much time on it. Do not ever, as a real estate broker, draft contract language or write contract language. What are we allowed to do? Fill in the blanks. What if your client gives you a direct instruction? Mark this out. Write this in there. What do you do? No. No. You hand them the pen and you say, you are free to make that change if you want to. It's your contract. I highly recommend you don't do that. I highly recommend we contact who? A lawyer. An attorney or a lawyer. Somebody who knows what they're doing with contract law to make those changes for you. We good on that? Look at that, 9.59. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. I'll see you tomorrow night.